want to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles this morning to Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32 is where we'll be in just a, just a few moments. So it's been almost five years um, since September the 23rd, 2018. At 3 o'clock Mountain Standard Time, on that date, Betsy and I summited our first 14er, Quandry Peak. It was painful. It was a 3,300-foot elevation gain over a 3.4-mile steep and rocky climb up, 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 up. Didn't think we'd ever get through going up. But that is the view we got from the top. We've had the joy and the pain. The pain and the joy, in that order, is the way it works, to do three more 14ers since that day. And there are two common denominators I'll go ahead and give you of every one of those hikes to the summit of over 14,000 feet. Number one, the climb is simply painful and exhausting. You just got to know. If you ever decide you want to do this, you will hurt. You will hurt for hours. You will hurt for days after it's over. And secondly, the view from the top, it's worth it. It's worth the pain. It's so worth it. We've done it every year since that first one, except this last fall when we both got sick when we were out there trying to do it in September. We're thinking about prayer this morning. And when you think about prayer, don't you love those times when you've got a true need, you pray about it, in accordance with God's word, I want to be clear, these are, this is not a prayer where you're treating God like a genie in a box, right? In a bottle, you're not just rubbing and get, hoping to get your wish, something just that you want. You've got a real need in life. You're praying according to, to, to the scriptures in line with God's word, what God says he wants for us and how he says he works in our world. You're not praying selfishly, in other words. And I mean, you have the need, you pray, and boom, God answers. Don't you love those? Anybody? Man. God works that way sometimes. Now, I don't know about you. I could stand him to work that way a lot more often <laughs> in my life than he does. And so what about the many other times. What's going on when the answer doesn't come? Or when it appears that an answer is never going to come? Because we've been praying, it seems like, forever. Maybe so long that maybe you've quit praying. Because God, obviously, after this many years, he's not going to answer. Now, obviously, sometimes God may simply never do what we're asking him to do, even though we, we, we're praying a biblical prayer. And he doesn't explain himself. We may live the rest of our lives and, and, and some prayers go unanswered and we never get the reason why until we see Him. Wasn't a bad prayer? Wasn't selfishly prayed? God just deserves the right to be God and He didn't have to answer every prayer and, and He didn't have to, have to do everything we want Him to do even when it's based on His own heart. But there are other times in this long waiting prayer when it seems that God calls us to linger for a while. And what I want to talk to you about this morning, and that is painful prayer. There's times you feel like in prayer, you've been climbing up, up, up. 
You've prayed so long. You've, got, you've, gotten, you've gone so, so, so long on, on this journey of prayer. The air's thin up there. You, you, you can't breathe. You're exhausted. And it seems that God sometimes wants us to linger in painful prayer. The truth I want you to take home today from Genesis 32 is very simply this. Broken-hearted, wrestling prayer is often the path to God's most needed blessings. Broken-hearted, wrestling prayer is often the path to God's most needed blessings. Genesis 32, we pick the text up in verse 9, and Jacob is speaking and, and, and praying to God. Oh, and Jacob said, O oh God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, O oh Lord, who said to me, Return to your country and to your kindred, that I may do you good. I am not worthy of the least of all the deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you've shown to your servant. For with only my staff I crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two camps. Please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him that he may come and attack me, the mothers with the children. You'll remember the story. Jacob across the Jordan and gone and ended up getting two wives. He only was looking for one, but he ended up with two because the there's a little bit of trickery with the father there and ends up staying in that land for a lot longer than he ever intended. God blessed him. He built up this massive deal. But you remember what happened before he left? He had stolen Esau's birthright. He and his mother had connived a plan and tricked his dying father, his very aged father, and stolen Esau's birthright. And when he left, Esau absolutely hated him. In fact, that's what drove him across the river. And, and there he began the search for a wife and, a, and another life. But God comes to him and says, hey, go home. Well, he's afraid of Esau. And considering what he did to his brother with good reason. And so he's praying to God here and he's saying, God, I, I'm afraid. I'm, I'm scared of what I'm going to find. You told me to go back. I'm on the way. We're in, we're, we're, we've come to the edge of the Jordan here. And then in verse 12 he says, after just saying he's afraid, I'm afraid Esau's going to come and attack us, but, talking to God, but you said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. God, I'm coming back to you, and I'm reminding you of what you told me. I'm praying, I'm scared, and I need help, and I'm reminding you, you told me, you said that you would bless me. Skipping down to verse 22 of this chapter. The same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket. And Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Penal, saying, for I have seen, seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. Jacob's encounter with God wrestling God that night is a picture for us of the reality that brokenhearted, wrestling prayer is often the path to God's most needed blessings. I want you to learn with me three lessons about painful prayer this morning. First of all, persistent prayer is sometimes required. 
Persistent prayer is sometimes required. Yes, there's those times when we pray one time and boom, God answers. But there are other times when persistent prayer is required. God had prophesied before Jacob and his twin brother Esau were born that his blessing, God's blessing, would be on Jacob. In Genesis 25, verses 21 to 23, here's what it says. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The children struggled together within her, at the two twin boys, and she said, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. Which is right the opposite of how things work in that culture. And in most cultures, the younger typically serves the older. But in this case, God said, I've chosen Jacob, not Esau. My blessing will be on Jacob. Through Jacob, I will work in the world. We know ultimately through the line of Jacob to bring us who? Jesus, God's Messiah for Israel and the Savior of the nations. And so this had been prophesied. But Jacob was, as we've already kind of alluded to, in and of himself, a rascal. He was a rascal. His name means grasper or deceiver, and he was both. Uh, the picture as, uh, as, as, the, as the two boys were born, Scripture gives us, is when, when, they, when, when, they, when they were born, uh, Esau came out uh, first, and, 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 and Jacob was grasping Esau's heel. The word also means deceiver. He came out hanging on to Esau's heel as if to say, wait, I wanted to be first. And that's kind of how he lived his life thereafter. Spent a good portion of his life grasping for prominence, even if it meant deceiving his own father. Again, he and his mother did that with excellence when they deceived Isaac and robbed Esau of his birthright of blessing as the oldest son. But it wasn't until this night that the blessing God had promised before his birth was actually given by God. And it only came through persistent prayer. You know, the Bible gives us 3,000 of God's promises to his people. Isn't that amazing? Sure, there's a bunch of them that were uh, to, to made to specific people for specific situations. But Paul says that all of God's promises are what? Yes, in Jesus. That is to say, that's 2 Corinthians 1, verse 20, if you want to take a look at that later. That is to say, Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of all that God has ever done or will do to give his blessings to us in this world. And so I just want to stop and ask this question. Do you know what God has promised you in Jesus? Do do, do you know the promise, the hope of the gospel, God's grace in Jesus? Most of you in the room today, I trust, know Christ as Savior. But if you're here and you don't know Him, if you're joining us via live stream this morning and you don't know Him, then I want to to cry out to you. I I want to appeal to you. I want to invite you. Come to Jesus. Run to the Savior. The Bible tells us that God is holy and we are not. The Bible says that because God is holy and we are sinners, God in His holy justice has pronounced the death sentence on all of humanity. We are under the condemnation of a holy and righteous God and it is right that we be because He is holy and we are not. And on our own, we are without hope. Scripture says. In other words, we're in a predicament that we can't do not one thing about in and of ourselves. We can't fix ourselves. We can't appease God. The truth is, we can't stop doing the stuff that, that, that brings the judgment of God called sin. And yet, God gave His own Son He was born into this world as a man. Fully God, fully man. How does all that work? 
no idea, but it's real and true. He became one of us. He grew to be a man who his whole life perfectly fulfilled the law of God in our place. He did everything God required of humanity. He did it for us as our substitute, as our, in our stead. Then he went to the cross, and there he died, and in his body on that tree bore all of our sins and God's punishment for, toward our sins. He bore it for us. He was cursed for us. God punished him in our place. He died. That was the requirement for our sins, death. The wages of sin, Scripture says, is death was buried three days. On the third day, he rose from the dead in victory, proving that he had paid the price in full and proving that he had victory over both sin and death. And he now lives as the only possible Savior of the world. How can a dead man save anybody? Hello? From death? If he's dead, he's dead. He was just a good prophet, a neat teacher, Whatever. Jesus lives because he lives as the only qualified, able Savior and Redeemer of the world. And so I want to invite you this morning, come to him. Because when you come to him, Scripture says all of our sins can be forgiven. He paid for every one of them. And when I trust him, he forgives me of all my sins, past, present, and future. Not only that, but his righteous life that he lived in my place, it's credited to my account. So God not only just sees me as, not, as, as being forgiven and, and not having sin anymore, he sees me as having righteousness that I don't have personally and practically in my own life. It's been given to me as a gift. He's put it in my, my spiritual bank account, and I who was bankrupt am now spiritually rich because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And he sees me as righteous as Jesus is. Does that not blow your mind? And so day by day, he indwells me by his spirit, and I walk with him. He walks with me. And at the end of this life, I will be ushered into his presence where I'll never not see his face again. I'll live with him forever. I'll worship him forever. We'll be home like we've never been home. This is the hope that is ours in Jesus Christ. This is the hope that we have. But there, and what a promise. The promise of heaven. The promise of forgiveness. The promise of righteousness. The, the, the promise of his presence in this life. The promise of heaven for eternity. But the scripture's full of so many more promises. God wants to do so many more things in our lives as his children. He's promised to help us overcome that sin. He's promised to embolden us to be that witness to that person that you're thinking about right now that needs Jesus. He's promised to provide for us. He's promised to, to, get, to, to, to allow us to have hearts that are content in what he's given us. And, 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 and it just goes on and on and on. The promises of God. Ephesians 1 verse 3 puts it this way. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. You know what that means? Let me translate that for you. If there's a blessing to be given by God to you, he's done it already in Jesus. If heaven holds a blessing, it's already been given to you if you are in Christ Jesus today. And Paul said, blessed be the God and Father who's done this. Because he's blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. We're told that there are over $5.8 billion worth of gift cards that go unclaimed, unredeemed every year. You might want to remember that next time you give a gift card. You might just want to keep the cash. The goods and the benefits have already been purchased, but people never enjoy them. Because they're too lazy to go to the store and use the gift card. And we laugh. How stupid is that? But you know what? Maybe you're not laughing because you probably got one in your wallet right now. And it's been there since last Christmas. I don't mean 22. I'm talking 21. 
And that's the way we walk around as sons and daughters of the living God. As recipients of the grace of God in Jesus, as those of whom Paul spoke, who have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. We live anemic spiritual lives, weak, as if there's not a Savior, as if His Spirit doesn't indwell us, as if this book doesn't have any answers, as if there's nothing in here that can strengthen me for temptation, as if there's nothing in here that can move me to a, a, a deeper and more consistent prayer life, as if, as if God's not given us what we need, and yet He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing. We've got a wallet full of gift cards waiting to be redeemed, and we just keep living life as if we don't have any cash. And so since I've got the word, are you in this book enough to know what's in your wallet? What God has filled your account in Christ with. I can just tell you this. If you're not in this book, you're not going to know. God in his sovereignty... And his way of ruling the world has just decided that when you get saved, he doesn't just automatically zap you with a full knowledge of everything you've got in Christ. You can just leave the Bible closed, and you're just going to know and grow and thrive, and man, it's just going to be amazing. No, he, he's, he's designed our lives for whatever reason in his wisdom that we grow day by day in dependence on him and knowledge of him. He's given us all we need, Peter said, for life and godliness through the knowledge of Him. But the knowledge of Him comes through the Word of God given so graciously to us. And His Spirit lives in us and He's our teacher. And as we open this book and study it on a daily basis, not because we have to, but because we want to know Him, we will grow. We will know more of Him. We'll see those promises. We'll live like the rich sons and daughters, the wealthy sons and daughters of the living God that we are. And when we do, our lives will be different. Obviously, again, we have to handle God's Word correctly. We have to understand the context of each promise. Make sure that the fulfillment of those promises for which we pray is in sync with the big picture of God's work in our world you can always find a verse and say, man, I, that, I want that promise to be me. You know that one about a lot of land he made to Israel? Yeah. God, I, I want, you know, we, we, you, can, you can twist up Scripture. You've you got to get, uh, you got to have a right understanding of Scripture. Handle it rightly, as Paul would say. But with that said, hear me. We need to be praying the promises of God back to God. That's what Jacob did. But you said, God, I'm afraid, but you said... I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. Do you know enough of his promises to pray them back to him and, and be able to say, God, I am scared, I am tempted, I'm weak, but you said. And I'm asking you, God, to do what you said you would do for me. Jacob was crying out to God for deliverance. He admitted his unworthiness back there in verse 10. But then as he's asking for God's help, he says, Because God, you said that you would bless me. I'm asking you, simply asking you, to do for me what you said you would do for me. But it took a whole night of wrestling prayer for God to give the blessing. Now, there was a little rest, literal wrestling match that happened. I don't understand all the details. I don't understand. I'm not going to try to explain what it means when God says, realizes, the man realizes he's not prevailing with Jacob. What is that? I don't know. I don't know what all is going on there. But all night they wrestle. Jacob wouldn't quit. Jacob wanted the blessing of God. In verse 24, we read it again. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Are you willing to wrestle with God in prayer to be able to enjoy the innumerable blessings of God in Christ personally? It 
So kind of get back up and get the picture. So Jacob says to God in prayer, you said this is what you were going to do, but then this wrestling match happens. Why? Why didn't God just answer? It almost appears that God is being indifferent or unwilling. I mean, it almost seems hostile or resistant, does it not? To give the blessing that he promised. I mean, all night Jacob had to wrestle with God. You know, we see this apparent indifferent hesitancy, if you will, or seemingly uncaring resistance We learn about that in the the ministry of Jesus. The Syrophoenician woman came to Jesus to get healing for her daughter. And Jesus said to her, Woman, it's not right that I take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. In other words, you're not even a Jew. And here you come asking me, the Messiah of of Israel, to do something for you. You're, you're, You're a Gentile. I mean, he called the woman a dog. Do you hear what I mean? Jesus, Jesus. I've heard commentators say, oh, well, I mean, the word that he used means small dog. I mean, but, I mean a dog's a dog. <laughs> now, he's going to end up healing her. But in that first moment, he almost appears hostile and indifferent to her, doesn't he? Jesus once said in, there in another place that prayer is like an old poor widow who needed justice on something, but, but couldn't get the judge, even, an, uh, even this unjust judge she was going to, couldn't get the judge to pay attention to her because she was poor and couldn't afford a lawyer or didn't have any money to bribe him. So, what does she do? She, 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 she goes to the judge's house day and night, wears him down. Whenever he gets ready to go to bed and gets laid down good and gets comfortable and starts dozing off, what does she do? Judge! Wake up, I need to talk to you. Judge, it's me again. Yep, I was here Monday. It's Tuesday. Wednesday night, I'm still here. Saturday evening, I'm here tonight too. Judge. Judge. Every time he goes in in or out of the house, she's there like, hey, have you had a chance to look at my case? And finally he says to himself, these are Jesus' words, not mine. I don't care a thing about this woman. I don't care a thing about justice. Remember, this is not even a good judge, but this woman has flat worn me down. So I'm going to give her what she asks because she's been so persistent. Then Jesus said, that's what prayer is like sometimes. You know, that's one of those stories I'm glad Jesus told, not me, right? What's he trying to say? God is clearly not someone who doesn't love us or care about justice. He's not like the unjust judge. The cross has shown us once and for all that he loves us. And that nothing can ever separate us from his love. He's trying to say that praying often feels like that. God often appears hostile and indifferent and and even uncaring toward us. But he's training us to keep praying and persevering faith. And to be persistent like the widow. Martin Luther said this, like a child trying to push against the hand of a parent, the parent gives only enough resistance to test the resolve of the child so God resists us in prayer to see our resolve in trusting his goodness. Man, he wants us to believe that he's good. He's proven it through his son. Can I ask you a question? And I'm asking, I'm, I'm, I'm asking myself the same question. Who do I think I am? When I quit praying for somebody that needs Jesus because I've been praying so long and I get this attitude in my heart and mind to where I'm just kind of like, you know, God's parent not going to save that one. Who who do I think I am? Because what I'm saying is, God, I know you tell us that you want to save people. I know that Christ died for people, but 
I don't know, I, I think maybe, maybe you don't really like this one. You're not good. I mean, you're good. You've been good if you already answered, but apparently you're, you're, not, you're not good. And we just we start playing God. And yet the cross still stands. Jesus is still alive. Never doubt God's goodness and commitment to bless you. Take him at his word that he already has shown all goodness and blessing in heavenly places to us in Christ Jesus. So the question is, will you, will I persist in prayer? Let me just ask you, does the judge know you? Does he know about me? Does he hear my voice often enough to recognize it? By the way, God knows you. You never pray. He sees you. Obviously, there's a breakdown in the, in the analogy. But the point is, what does your prayer life look like? Are you persistent enough in prayer to be like this widow? Are we knocking on his door until he answers? Remember, God's love for you has been proven once and for all on the cross of Christ. And his power for your life has been demonstrated once and for all in the resurrection of Jesus. There is nothing he cannot do. Persistent prayer. Is sometimes required. But secondly, uh, learn with me this morning this truth. Winning in prayer comes by losing to God. Winning in prayer comes by losing to God. Verse 25, when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob... Then he said, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. God knew Jacob's name. God wanted Jacob to admit who he had been, how he'd lived his life. It seems as if Jacob needed to acknowledge to God, I'm a liar. I am that conniver, a, a, a grasper, a deceiver. I've tried to manipulate and deceive my way to get blessed on my own without depending on you, God. But now I repent and I acknowledge that I need you. I don't deserve it. I certainly haven't earned it. But I need your presence. I'm not going to let go until you bless me because I need your help and your help your presence, your goodness to me is the greatest blessing in all of life. And so God, as Jacob comes to the end of himself, gives him a new name, Israel, which speaks both of Jacob's wrestling with God and God's blessing him freely and sovereignly. So many of us are like Jacob. We spend our lives striving, deceiving, worrying, manipulating trying to get what we thought we most needed in life, the things we call blessings. But the truth is, what we think we need, what we have to strive to obtain and lie to get, those things are not what we truly need. Only God himself is the blessing we truly need. He alone will satisfy our hearts as they were designed to be satisfied, as we live in a worshipful relationship with Him, always enjoying His presence and His power in our lives. You see, winning in prayer comes by losing to God, surrendering to Him. One of our men here in our church who's in a group where we read Scripture together and then we text each other truths and applications that stood out to us, wrote this concerning this passage a few, a few months ago. It is only when God wrestles our will into submission, when we become so sick of ourselves that we cry out, God, I won't let you go until you bless me. It's only then that God can change me, the, the sneaky, dirty, selfish, ankle-grabbing, usurping, conniving manipulator and to he who contends and wrestles with God. When that happens, when we stop quenching the Holy Spirit, only then will our minds, our hearts, our actions, and our desires reflect the beauty, love, and grace, and glory of Jesus. 
Now, let's don't forget that dislocated hip. I've never had a truly dislocated joint. How many of you ever had something dislocated, like for real out of joint? Okay. Well, from what I understand, it's terrible. The hip's the largest joint in the body, and so, again, from what I understand, it is excruciating pain. According to this passage and the rest of Scripture, sometimes God graciously intervenes in our story, just as He did in Jacob's, in such a way that we cannot forget because there's a permanent reminder of our weakness, our need for Him built into our daily experience. For Jacob, it was that limp He gave him. Here's a question. Are we... Willing for God to answer our prayers with a dislocated hip? Or whatever the equivalent that he chooses for our lives so that we never forget our dependence on him? Happened in Paul's life. And he had to get to that place, didn't he? You remember? 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7. Paul says, so to keep me from becoming conceited. Remember, God did amazing things in Paul's life. Jesus showed directly, showed personally, revealed to Paul amazing things. And Paul said, so to keep me from becoming conceited, spiritually arrogant, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this that it should leave me alone. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. What was Paul's thorn? We have no idea. People got a lot of ideas. We don't know. What we know is the thorn got left to keep him dependent on Jesus. And as Jesus said, my grace will be sufficient in your weakness. And in your weakness, my strength can be seen. Are we willing for God to put us there? That he might be seen in us. That his power might be demonstrated in our weakness. You see, persistent prayer is sometimes required. Winning in prayer comes by losing to God. But finally, we must never forget this morning, according to verses 29 and 30 of our text, God himself is the blessing we need. Verse 29, then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. Amazing grace that he wasn't consumed by the face to face presence of Almighty God. Jacob asked who he is, and God basically says, You ought to know by now we've been wrestling all night who I am. And he blesses him. You know, God never says here that all is going to go well with Esau. Remember, that's where this all started. Hey, God, you said you'd bless me, and I'm nervous because when I go home, I'm scared of Esau. God doesn't resolve his problem with his brother. He doesn't say. He blesses him. He says, I'm here, and I'm going to be with you there But he never says, don't worry about it. Got got that handled for you. He just says, Jacob, I'm God and I'm here. And guess what? That's enough. And what's even more interesting is God disabled Jacob. And now, if old Esau comes after him, he can't even run. God may not answer your prayers by resolving your problems or changing your circumstances, but rather by changing you and assuring you of His presence. 
Jacob thought Esau was his biggest problem. The truth was, Jacob was Jacob's biggest problem. Can I tell you a secret? I'm my own biggest problem. It's not my circumstances, it's not other people, it's me. And you guessed it. It's you. What he ultimately wants to do in our hearts is to get us to the place where we realize that our relationship with God is the blessing of all blessings. His presence. Who he is, knowing him, being his child, and his nearness to us, that is the blessing. He is who we need. Not what, but who we need. Far more than any of the what's that we've ever thought we had to have. Persistent prayer is sometimes required. Winning in prayer comes by losing to God. God himself is the blessing we need. So when you get tired of praying, when it seems like God isn't listening, when God seems to be distant and uncaring, when that family member isn't changing, though you've been praying for years, when that friend still continues in unbelief and rebellion against God, listen to me, don't quit wrestling and hanging on to God in prayer. Don't quit quoting his, word, his own words from the Scriptures back to him in prayer because broken-hearted wrestling prayer is often the path to God's most needed blessings. You see, sometimes only painful prayer will do. Is God calling you this morning into broken-hearted wrestling prayer for someone or some situation in your life? Maybe you're already in the middle of it. Maybe you just needed encouragement to keep wrestling this morning. Is God calling East L.J. Baptist Church to, to broken-hearted wrestling prayer over our own love for the world and lukewarm hearts that we might be freed from compromise and sin and empowered by the Spirit to walk in holiness? Is He calling us to that? Is God calling us as a church to broken-hearted wrestling prayer for the lost that we know personally? I, and I know many of you, believe deeply in corporate prayer. That is praying together. I believe in it deeply because God's Word, especially the book of Acts, convinces me of its centrality in the life of the early church. The early church that turned the Roman Empire upside down without any clout, any political power, no financial strength whatsoever. The church was waiting in corporate prayer on the day of Pentecost when God sent His Spirit in power and the gospel was preached in many languages by all the believers there and 3,000 people were saved in a day. Acts chapter 2. The church wrestled in corporate prayer after the apostles were arrested and threatened and forbidden to preach the gospel went back to the church and they all gathered and they wrestled with God in prayer that night and God shook that building, literally, in which they were meeting and then He empowered them by His Spirit to go out. And you know what they did the next day? They continued to preach the gospel with boldness and great power. And it says in the text in Acts chapter 4 that great grace was upon them all. Like people could see the hand of God at work in their lives. What if... What if we were to corporately wrestle in prayer week after week, month after month? Might we see God act in power through His church here? Might we see something that could actually be called revival? Might we actually see something like what appears to be happening at Asbury College and other campuses across our nation, what, what we're beginning to hear reports, God spreading His power by His Spirit amongst His people and churches. Might we see God act in power through His church here? 
I, I just want you to know, I want to encourage you in this. There's a group among you that is doing that every Sunday night. It's been happening for months. It's been happening for years. Every Sunday night. We've seen God answer prayer. There are people we prayed for by name who have come to know Jesus. We've seen God sustain and comfort other people in illness and, and, and death. We've seen God change hearts that seemed unchangeable. And we've seen God do things we didn't even ask for. Even in recent days in the lives of people in our community that we didn't even know. God's brought some of you into the room that we didn't even know before. So I just encourage you all to get in on this thing. It's pretty awesome. A lot of times, though, I'll tell you, it's hard. A lot of times it's painful. It's exhausting. Remember Jacob wrestled with God all night and was left with a dislocated hip. God didn't say it wouldn't be. But just like that painful climb to the summit of a 14,000 foot peak, what God allows us to see when we pray together and we pray persistently, it's worth it. It's worth it. So I want to encourage you to get in on that. Man, what a blessing. I also want to encourage you, we always do this this time of year. Don't know why there's no magic to any of this. I, have, I, don't even, I just came across it one day and thought, hey, let's use that. On your way out this morning on the desk, not the round table where the uh, welcome team stands, but behind that there's a desk. Pick up one of these. It's a little sheet of paper. It says seven for seven prayer list. It's seven weeks from today. Easter is seven weeks from today. And so what we do every year, we just write down seven names. We pray for seven people for seven weeks. We ask God, these, and these are predominantly people that need Christ. You're praying for lost people on this list. So I just encourage this is just a practical way to pray. Wrestle in prayer for seven people for the next seven weeks. And then when time gets close, invite them. And you can, you can see it on here. It's right here on the sheet. Invite them to our Good Friday service, which will be April 7th at 6 o'clock. Or our Easter Sunday service, which is April the 9th at 11 o'clock. Uh, pray for seven weeks. Wrestle in, with, with God in prayer for their salvation. And then invite them to church. One or both of those two days. Will you do that and just believe God? Brokenhearted, wrestling prayer is often the path to God's most needed blessings. Ephesians 3, verse 20 and 21, as we close. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church. And in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever, amen. All of our brokenhearted wrestling prayer is to be for the glory of Christ in and through his church in this world. And you can be assured he can do more than we would even dare to ask him. But I want to challenge you, dare to ask him. Ask him to do things you don't think he can do. And as you pray, pray like the man who prayed, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Grow my faith. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen.